Hi, this is Sally and welcome to Reclaiming Pride, LGBT plus survivors of narcissistic abuse. Before we start, there is a trigger warning. The episodes of this podcast may at times refer to domestic violence, emotional, financial and sexual abuse. To begin this week, I'd like us to start, as always, with a one word feelings check. How are you doing in this moment? Not how is the person you're taking care of doing, not how are you making other people feel, but how are you doing? And what's one word for that in this moment? This week, we're going to be looking at how pop psychology self-help will not work with an NPD person. I'll preface all of this by saying that I have written and facilitated hundreds of workshops for folks seeking a better understanding of themselves, their partners, and even how addiction has affected them. When I used to facilitate these sessions, I would lean heavily on the work of practitioners such as Brene Brown. I wrote and facilitated on boundaries, empathy, igniting trust, radical compassion, vulnerability, and conflict resolution. Then I would promptly go home afterwards and none of this would work with my narcissistic ex. And the abuse would continue and it would escalate. I think my facilitation of these sessions was another way of me holding out hope which is very common for abused partners. We hold out hope that things will change, get better. There must be a key to all of this, surely, right? The more participants came to me and wrote to me after the sessions and told me that what we'd done in the session had worked, the more I lived vicariously through them because I knew it would never happen for me and my NPDX. So let's start by looking at conventional self-help and why this never works for people with narcissistic personality disorder or NPD. So conventional self-help techniques often don't work effectively with individuals who have NPD due to the unique characteristics and challenges that they have, that they have with this disorder. So NPD is a complex and deep-seated psychological condition characterized by pervasive pattern of Things like grandiosity, lack of empathy, a constant need for admiration and adulation and attention. So here's why conventional self-help might not be effective for these individuals. So the first one is their lack of awareness. So people with NPD typically lack insight into their own behavior and its impact on others. They may not recognize that they have a problem or that their behavior is even causing harm. They also actually don't care that they are harming others. By and large, they really don't. This lack of self-awareness makes it difficult for them to engage in self-reflection. Now, this is a crucial aspect of self-help. They will often mock and ridicule the process as if it's below them. They'll ironically act as if they're actually the only ones who don't need it. The next one is defensiveness. So individuals with NPD often have fragile egos, that are propped up by these grandiose self-images. So when faced with any kind of criticism or suggestions for personal growth, they may become defensive, deny their shortcomings, or shift blame onto other people, projection. This defensiveness impedes their ability to consider constructive feedback and change. It's almost impossible, basically, to give them feedback without them becoming either angry, defensive, or extremely upset. Even if the feedback is highly constructive and kind, they will still find a way to make it seem like they're being attacked. The next one is their manipulative behavior. So people with NPD can be very skilled manipulators. They try and control and dominate the therapy sessions and therapy process. This can hinder the effectiveness of therapy and make it difficult for therapists to maintain a balanced and productive dynamic. So oftentimes, I've heard sort of very anecdotally in the past when I've spoken to therapists and people who've been in therapy who are survivors of narcissistic and toxic relationships, therapists have often shared that if they know that someone has any of the 4B cluster personality disorders, they may actually say no to the client simply because they are not equipped to serve that person. That it's a very a very stringent set of practices that the person has to have in order to be a clinician to work with somebody with NPD, BPD, HPD, and antisocial personality disorder. The next one is one of the cardinal traits of NPD, which is lack of empathy. So empathy is a cornerstone of any self-improvement because it involves understanding and considering the feelings of other people. So people with NPD struggle with empathy, and this makes it hard for them to grasp how any of their actions might affect those around them. This makes it challenging for them to develop the emotional insight 
needed for self-help. Also, don't forget, as we'd said in the previous episode, gaslighting, word salad and projection, the narcissist has arrested development around the age of a toddler. Now, this might sound ridiculous and facetious, but I'm, I'm being serious. On closer examination, the emotional age of the NPD individual closely resembles that of a toddler. The next one is the need for external validation. So individuals with NPD have an intense need for external validation and admiration. Now, practically everybody does, but the difference is that with them, it's constant, it's pathological, and they will punish you if you do not give it. This could be someone who's in a relationship with that person or a complete stranger. Conventional self-help often emphasizes introspection and personal growth for intrinsic reasons. Now, this doesn't align with the NPD individual's focus of seeking approval from others. Next, we have resistance to vulnerability. So self-help often requires embracing vulnerability acknowledging mistakes and being open to change. People with NPD tend to avoid vulnerability and will not admit their imperfections as this threatens their self-image of superiority and perfection. It also gives into the deep-seated, cruel voice inside of them that's constantly punishing them. Although you would never know this because of their outward behavior and the way they treat other people. The Jungian scholar Nathan Salon Schwartz wrote in his book, Narcissism and Character Transformation, it is interesting and even psychotherapeutically useful to have persons suffering from NPD study their face in a mirror. Often they will see someone of great power and effectiveness, precisely the qualities that they feel a lack of. For even though they may overwhelm others with their energy and personal qualities, they themselves feel ineffective. So this passage really just sort of captures the basic relationship between the narcissist's true self, which is this kind of tortured little raisin it's inside the person, inside this grandiose exterior, and the false self. So the false self of a narcissist is the person that they present to other people, even their own family. So it's, it's that pervasive, it's that pathological. The next item to consider for why conventional self-help won't work for an NPD individual is long-term patterns. So NPD is deeply ingrained and rooted in long-standing behavior patterns that have likely developed over decades, years for this person. This is a truly pathological disorder and there is no real cure. These patterns are resistant to quick fixes or surface level changes which are typically advocated in all of the self-help materials that you see. The next one is professional guidance. So navigating the complexities of MPD requires the expertise of a mental health professional. Yes, and they need to be experienced in working with personality disorders. So self-help materials will lack the depth and guidance necessary to address the intricacies of this kind of personality disorder. Still and all, the narcissist would need to admit that they have a problem in order to even seek out this therapy. And this feeling for them would be tantamount to suicidal. And that is not an exaggeration. So they're, you know, it would be the sacrifice of their false self, which everything they know hangs on that. And they will torture other people throughout their life in order to maintain it. They would then need to seek the help for what is wrong. This is extremely rare given the nature of their disorder. So given all of this, can any therapy work for an NPD individual? This raises a really challenging question. For most psychiatric diagnoses like depression, phobias, OCD, schizophrenia, anorexia, bulimia, there is a lot of literature and history in medicine describing evidence-based treatments for these disorders. These might include things like psychotherapy, treatment with drugs, a pharmacological approach, psychosocial interventions, all except for narcissistic personality disorder. There is very little good evidence that shows that treatment works for this disorder in any long-term manner, because narcissistic personality disorder is a relatively stable disorder that doesn't shift much over time. You might find that there are treatments to enhance specific behaviors, such as attending appointments on time or managing rage and volatility, but not the narcissistic person will still remain relatively callous, snarky, 
in sessions and things like that. So what a therapist would need to focus on with someone like that is establishing rapport, establishing trust, which is going to be extremely difficult because the narcissist is always kind of looking around for the next shooter drop, for the next person that's going to attack them. What they might try and do is help the narcissist connect the dots between what may have been a very difficult childhood, not always, but it may have been, and also helping them carefully manage the boundaries of therapy. So for example, they can't just go longer in a session because that's what they want, or they can't just start later at their convenience whenever and wherever, and this would be typical of their behaviour. So at this point, I want to bring your attention to something called cognitive empathy when it comes to the narcissist. In the episodes before this one, we've often talked about the narcissist struggling extremely hard with empathy, issues with it. Um, it's almost completely absent in some people with NPD or completely absent. Some narcissists, though, do appear to have some empathy. It's usually with situations and with people that would affect them or have a general direct effect on their life and so on. Or it could be empathy for people who they have little or no connection with and see sporadically or empathy with a character in a movie or something like that. And then they might turn around and be very abusive to the people in their own household. So what they can possess and what they tend to do is have something called cognitive empathy. So this is something that is learned they have taught themselves this and sometimes in therapy when therapists who are trained to deal with people who have NPD they will start to teach them cognitive empathy. This is really the therapist kind of steering them towards the right things to do um, and the narcissist has to then agree to adhere to those right things to do. The thing is the narcissist knows what is right and wrong. They know all of that. It's just that they care not to adhere to it. So cognitive empathy means they're literally metacognitively thinking about, oh, I should be feeling this now. Let me do X, Y, Z or let me say X, Y, Z. It will not come naturally to them. So it's, it's performative, but this is something that can be learned. It's very rare, but it's something that can be learned and it's called cognitive empathy. The only thing is that there is virtually no evidence base pointing to the successful treatment of a person suffering from narcissistic personality disorder to a degree that their interpersonal relationships are significantly improved. So did you seek couples therapy or joint therapy sessions with the NPD person in your life? And what was it like? I know I did. So when I did this with my ex, the following things happened in sequence. So first of all, she was the one who suggested it because she was saying, I have so many issues that we needed to get a handle on all of them so that we could move forward and get to a, she used this phrase a lot, good place, and that I could fall in line with her vision of what that relationship should be. So I researched the therapist and I found one. The only background factor I looked at was whether she was LGBT plus friendly, which she was, she was a lesbian. This person was not trauma informed to my knowledge. I didn't even know that phrase at that time and wasn't versed in personality disorders. The sessions were all hijacked by my ex. She had this at first in the first sort of one or two sessions, she had this kind of faux friendliness and tried to make it seem that I was the whole problem, kind of trying to sidle up verbally with, with the therapist who wasn't buying it, obviously, because she's a therapist. And the whole kind of notion that she approached it with my ex was, you know, well, you know, you can see what I'm dealing with here. Can you please try and help me with this? After a couple of weeks, the therapist started to ask me for my point of view. And this is where it all went totally south. I spoke the truth and the sessions became angry and aggressive from my ex. At one point, she walked out and left me to continue the session alone. She yelled at the therapist who ended up defending me. She punched the couch. After these sessions, my ex would trap me somewhere. I remember one particular episode in Morningside Park in New York. She would then proceed to punish me by screaming, yelling, and raging at me in public. Why was I lying and putting on this act in the sessions just to get the therapist on my side? She would say, oh, little Sally again, trying to get attention from her drunk mom. And she would throw my childhood at me as well. They'll, they'll do things like that. Years later, we did try again for couples therapy. This time it was online. It was during COVID. So 
it was sort of mid 2020 and the same thing happened she literally ended up berating the therapist so badly that the therapist stopped the session and basically fired us she really didn't want to work with us anymore because couples therapy does not work with these people they have underlying core issues so npd often stems from a much deeper emotional wound and insecurity these underlying issues can be difficult to address in couples therapy especially if the individual with the npd is not open to exploring anything so if you are someone who is still in an abusive or toxic relationship and thinking about couples therapy please note that in cases where there is emotional psychological or even physical abuse Couples therapy might not be appropriate or safe. Safety should always be a priority for you. And addressing abusive behaviour may require a different therapeutic approach and it probably won't involve you being in the room. Because as I had, you may actually suffer afterwards. You're in the room, you're in a controlled or relatively controlled environment, but you have to consider your own safety. If in any way you, are, you need to be truthful in that space, just be aware that this is something that the NPD individual is not going to want you to do. Honestly, the best thing for you to do is seek therapy for yourself on your own. If you are still in the relationship, this will be a place for you to be heard, believed and validated. It can also kind of take the cork out of the stress that's built up over time by being with this person. And even if you're now free and you're considering seeing a therapist, here are some of the tips for finding the type of therapist who will believe you and who is a safe person. So here are some questions that I would suggest. Are you LGBT plus friendly? What is your experience with narcissistic personality disorder or the B cluster personality disorders? What is your experience with narcissistic abuse trauma? Do you explore family of origin dynamics? Do you help establish and work towards goals? So these are some very handy questions, kind of the top five, I would say, in really vetting out and finding the best therapist for you. Try to look for a therapist who practices active listening. They're compassionate and validating of your life and your feelings. They should model good boundaries, be honest and direct, and can also laugh at themselves and have a good sense of humor. That's always been an important one for me. They should get to know you well enough to identify when you start presenting with self-defeating patterns. They'll help you put words to your feelings and emotions, which can often be difficult. If you want it, they could give you homework. You can always ask for that, you know, if that's what you want. They have a flexible approach to your therapy and you want someone who gives you feedback and is also receptive to feedback. Now, I know that was a lot of information. We're going to take a quick break. And when we return, I have a journal entry prompt for you based on this week's topic. I'll see you in a moment. Hi and welcome back. This week's journal prompt asks us to look forward and consider how far we've come and also how therapy can support our journey. This journal entry prompt's title is Envisioning Change. Imagine your life after healing from the abusive relationship. How do you see yourself? How might therapy support you in becoming the person you aspire to be? So you can give yourself a timer to answer those two questions or you can just let yourself free write without any boundaries around it if you would like to do so. Sometimes I find it helps to give yourself a timer even if you just put it on for five minutes. And if you go beyond that five minutes, well, it can kind of make you feel good because you know you've got a little bit more to say. And if not, that's fine too. That journal entry is aimed at getting you to envision the change that you want to see and being that change. Please note, this podcast is not intended to replace professional therapy or counselling. It serves as a supplementary resource for support and encouragement. Listeners, you are encouraged to seek professional help if needed. I did, and it works for me every day. 
Stay tuned and I look forward to healing with you again next time. Bye-bye.